Hello and welcome to um, today's webinar. Um, today we will be talking about various strategies that can be utilized to understand the sources of air pollution in cities uh, across states and regions. And we will also hear about some examples from work that is ongoing in Ghana as well as in the Sub-Saharan African region. So we thank you all very much for joining us. My name is Pallavi Pant and I'm a scientist at the Health Effects Institute. And um, I'm very pleased to welcome our panelists for today's uh, session. We will uh, get started with just a little bit of a background and then we will hear from Mr. Emmanuel Apo at the Ghana Environmental Protection Agency, followed by some detailed talks from Dr. Michael Hannigan, who's at University of Colorado Boulder, and Dr. Eloise Vere, who's at University of Leicester in the UK, about different strategies that can be used for source apportionment work and some of the projects that they have been participating in. And towards the end, we will uh, spend some time answering any questions, hearing from all of you. So throughout the presentations and um, discussion, please feel free to submit your questions via the chat. And we will try and respond to as many questions during the webinar as we can. And um, for those questions that we cannot answer, we'll try and get back to you through email. So if we start thinking about um, air pollution levels around the world, we see that um, there are certain regions that really stand out. So we see India and China and the South Asian subcontinent. We also see parts of Africa that have uh, very high levels of air pollution in uh, Ghana, as well as in many other sub-Saharan African countries, these exposures can be very high. And if we start to think about what these high levels of exposure mean for the health impact, so you know how many deaths can we attribute to these uh, exposures and what their other kinds of economic and societal impacts can be, one thing starts to become very clear, which is that uh, while outdoor air pollution or ambient air pollution, particularly PM2.5, is um, relatively low in parts of uh, you know, sub-Saharan Africa. In Ghana, for example, it's about 35 micrograms. Uh, but with increasing urbanization and industrialization, we do expect to see outdoor air pollution to increase over the next few decades in the region. At the same time, household air pollution due to use of solid fuels for cooking in particular is still a big contributor to the health burden across the, the region. We see uh, you know, more than 390,000 deaths related to household air pollution in 2017 alone. But one other thing which is important to note here is that a lot of these estimates are based on data that is collected on the ground across the world and also satellite estimates. When we look at where the distribution of air quality monitors around the world is, and this is a map from uh, OpenAQ of real-time air quality monitors, we see that there's a huge gap in the African region. If we also look at ground monitoring, uh, manual monitoring stations, uh, the data set that is available through the WHO ambient air quality um, database, we see a few more stations in uh, African countries, but not as many as we see in North America, Europe, and parts of Asia. So one of the underlying themes is still, we need more air quality mon monitoring in these uh, countries in order to improve our understanding of what the air pollution levels and related impacts on health and society are. But at the same time, we need to be thinking about what sources are contributing to these uh, levels of air pollution. For example, understanding sources can help us figure out which are the particular low-hanging fruits that we can target to start reducing air pollution levels. We can communicate to the public, to the policymakers, what some of the impacts are. And we can also see how our countries are making progress because we get a baseline understanding of what uh, the numbers are. So last year, we invited a group of experts from countries around the world, including Ghana, India, US, UK, and Canada, 
to think more critically about ongoing work uh, related to understanding sources in Ghana. Our focus in this study was household air pollution and how it contributes to outdoor air pollution. And uh, two of the speakers here today, Dr. Mike Hannigan and Dr. Eloise Mere, were also a part of this expert panel. We looked at a number of studies that have been conducted in Ghana and came up with a few major um, recommendations. Firstly, while we understand that household air pollution is a problem and has impacts on uh, people's health, it is often not as well understood how big a contributor household air pollution can be to outdoor air pollution. So it's important to communicate this. In other studies in uh, India and China, for example, uh, HEI work has found that almost a quarter of all outdoor air pollution in India was coming from uh, household air pollution. So it's a big driver. And in countries in the sub-Saharan African region where household air pollution is even bigger a problem, we can, we can imagine what that contribution might be. The other thing is, of course, to try and start understanding and mapping out what the air quality levels are, what the sources are. So strengthening the emissions inventories, uh, Dr. Murray is going to talk about that in some detail. Uh, later in the webinar, as well as expanding the air quality monitoring uh, network across the region and in different countries. And finally, uh, looking at ways to harmonize ongoing efforts. There are a number of research projects, there are a number of other uh, projects at the government level, at the national level that are ongoing, and we need to identify ways that we can better coordinate across uh, projects to make sure we're leveraging the information that is becoming in available over time. But this is not just a story about Ghana. This also has implications for what other low and middle income countries can be doing. And there are lessons that we can all take away from this. We know we have a very global audience today. Um, so we just wanted to highlight that there are a number of assessments that are currently available that can serve as a good starting point for work in your cities and uh, states and countries. Um, and that we need a focus and you know a good amount of effort on developing local emissions inventories. They're very helpful in trying to understand what the source contributions are, expanding air quality monitoring, and again, there are tools which can be relatively simple and effective. One good example is the LEAP IBC uh, model, which is being used in several countries around the world right now to understand source contributions, as well as impacts on air quality and health. So we encourage you to look these resources up as well. Um, and we will, uh, at the end of the webinar, we will be sharing a list of resources via email where you can access most of the information that was you know, referred to during the webinar, as well as additional resources that might be helpful in the context of source apportionment and understanding how that can be used for policy making. So without um, you know, further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Emmanuel Apo, who's the Deputy Director at the Ghana Environmental Protection Agency, to share his thoughts uh, on this topic, as well as Tell us a little bit more about work that's ongoing in Accra and in Ghana uh, on understanding sources better. Mr. Apo? Um, I'm here with a colleague called Maxwell Sunu, who works with me at the Environmental Quality Department. Um, just as you, you mentioned in your presentation, uh, we started our monitoring, air quality monitoring, way back in 1998 in the mining areas and some few, um, a few uh, cities in, in Ghana. And um, we strengthened that in uh, 2005. And since then, we'll be able to deploy a whole lot of 15 of them. And then we have low cost monitors that we have uh, installed to be able to also have uh, steady setting um, high emitting areas that come from human pollution sources. So um, that has been done. And then, uh, we 
the information that we have currently, we have published the review of what we come up with the air quality management plan and the plan and communication plan to implement the actions that are enumerated in the air quality management plan. And this we did with the involvement of uh, to reduce air quality in the country. And this has been done and we'll be having a meeting to coordinate. Aside that, we also have a coordination with international and local partners on air quality management in Ghana. And we'll be working with Dabi and Co, Mike and then um, Henry, among others. So, um, some low costs have been uh, since have been deployed and working with to, to evaluate a uh, city called Jamestown, Choco. Um, and then, aside that, we also working with a uh, PMEH program that all of you are aware. Now, we with the implementation is to start and then preparatory work will be done with the near uh, in the month to come and we intend to also strengthen the source apportionment work and then analyze the filter to see where the various sources are coming for policy uh, to drive policy so that's also ongoing now then when we come to the echo uh, region we signed on to what we call the abj agreement for West and Central Africa countries on better air quality uh, management in the year 2009. So um, uh, we carried out some inventory evaluation on the implementation up to now. That was last year. And then we came out with some roadmap after looking at where uh, capacity building that will also be captured in, in, in the report for countries to be able to uh, look at them and look for the necessary funding to be able to just agreement Mr. Apo, the connection doesn't seem to be uh, very good. So, Hello, if, but you can hear me. Oh, you, we can hear you now. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Apo, we lost you again. I think um, we're experiencing some uh, technical difficulties in the-, in can the you, can you hear, did, did you hear me? Hello? No, Mr. Apple, did, we're... did you hear me on the bit of the ECOWAS, what we are making at the ECOWAS region? No, we, we lost you for the last two minutes or so. Yes, on the ECOWAS sub-region, I said Ghana, has been championing the uh, ECOWAS um, arena in, in terms of air quality management. And we are taking clue from the Abidjan agreement that we, we signed on to in 2009. So we met last year to review progress made implementation, uh, pollution from vehicles, poor quality, land degradation, forest degradation, mining, construction works, among 
other areas. So these are the areas that have been captured as a polluting source. So countries have been um, tasked to play their role to be able to reduce pollution from such source, including cooking. So um, this has been and then we come up with a communique. Every country should source for funding, tackle the problems, and also build on capacity. So um, we working with each country is supposed to work with uh, local partners and then foreign partners to see how they can pull resources and then. Build capacity to be able to we find in Ghana. So, um, on the echo world front, that's what. Um, Mr. Apple, we are really not able to hear what you're saying. Then, uh, Mr. Apple, we're not able to hear Okay, it looks like we are going to have trouble um, hearing Mr. Apple. So in the interest of time, we will uh, move on. Uh, okay, so what we are going to do, unfortunately, is move on to our next talk, and uh, we really apologize, the connection has been poor, but we will be sharing a written update with all of you after the webinar on everything that Mr. Abo was talking about, so you can, um, you know, track what he was mentioning. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Mike Hannigan, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, different strategies to understand air pollution sources and some of his work in Ghana. Mike? Hello, all. This is, thank you for the introduction. Um, first, I'd like to say that it, it's, I've had the privilege of uh, partnering with Mr. Uppo and his team, so uh, it's a shame that you guys can't hear uh, the skill of his air quality management. Um, so hopefully we'll, we will get that written statement. Thank you. <clears throat> so I just um, wanted to start here with this lovely figure from UNEP, um, which really describes um, how you add science to air quality management. And I think this is a really good <clears throat> way to think about things. And this is, I think, the path that we're seeing a lot of other places, particularly uh, in, a, in Ghana, where you start off with monitoring. Um, you, you think there's an air problem, so you, you add monitoring. Um, and you realize the levels of pollution, or PM2.5 in this case, are high, and then you start to think about um, where, the, where the PM2.5 is coming from. And so uh, to reduce emission levels, you have to know what source is first, right? And so that's, that's how we kind of move along this line um, or this arrow from two to three. And then from two to three, you're really seeing this difference of, you know, how are we looking at um, attributing the pollution to sources? And I think this is where you'll hear both from me and Eloise uh, uh, today, and, and I'll focus more on source apportionment and, uh, aspects. But then, you know, the idea is that you add science and so then you can, um, your air quality management um, <clears throat> will have the ability to, to um, will be more effective, I guess is the best way to think of it. So next slide. So the, <clears throat> so this is back to the whole key that, that source attribution or source apportionment really is essential to air quality management. And it's not simply, um, to figure out that, you know, diesel traffic is causing the PM 2.5. It's to really figure out um, spatial and temporal distributions of, of the diesel contributions, because it might be that during the worst episodes, um, diesels might not be important. It may be something else. And, and I'm, I'm showing here uh, a figure from a paper that was written uh, in regards to kind of this idea of monitoring and source apportionment um, and it was in a Jamie Shower and a group in, 
in Chile, in Santiago, where they, they collected half a year of PM 2.5 filters, and then they chemically analyzed them, and then they used the chemistry in a top-down source apportionment model called the chemical mass balance model, and I'll describe all this more later, um, to figure out the origins of the pollution at different times of year. And so this, you can imagine that on the right side here, that figure can help you understand when, you know, that wood smoke is an important um, source in June and July, and it's something that if you're trying to kind of reduce June and July pollution levels, your focus might be on wood smoke. But at other times of the year, wood smoke wouldn't necessarily reduce pollution. So it kind of gives you the idea of, of some of the nuances of this uh, source attribution approach. So going to the next slide. So the, the two approaches you're going to hear about kind of in terms of source apportionment today, um, are, I, we, we call them top down and bottom up. Top down um, I, is myself, I think of myself as a detective, because um, I like detectives. And then there's the bottom up approach that Eloise, is going to, Eloise will talk more about, which is more like the accounting approach. And it's like an emissions inventory approach. You can imagine that actually in most places, the two approaches are complementary. Um, and, and, the, and specifically the accounting approach, to be able to, to think into the future, the accounting approach really is necessary. Um, but the, the detective account approach also does help validate the accounting approach. So that's kind of the way it's often used. And I'll talk more again about the detective approach here, um, but I do encourage you if you haven't already read in the HA Communication uh, 19, it, there's a really nice discussion of, of the balance between these two um, approaches in that document but I'm gonna focus on the detective side of it today. <clears throat> so the next slide. So, so sorry, there's math, but it, I promise it's simple math. <laughs> the idea of the detective work is simply, um, if to, in the end, we wanna know what the source contribution is. We wanna know how much household air pollution or wood burning or diesel truck traffic is impacting the PM 2.5 um, in a certain region. That's a kind of an example question, right? And so. <clears throat> to be able to, to determine that the top-down approach, you might measure the ambient air pollution um, and the tracers and some kind of organic tracers in that pollution and then say something about how much of that pollution is coming from that source. And so I'm gonna just kind of walk through some of the simpler um, approaches to this, so next slide. And so this is the mathematical framework that's used in the models that I'm gonna talk about. In this mathematical framework, it looks kind of scary, but it's really simply a mass balance, um, so it's saying, the mass of pollutant X, or let's say cholesterol, in the air is the sum of the cholesterol from meat cooking, the cholesterol from the dust, and the cholesterol from some other source. And then the, the E is just like a, there's always some error associated with things. <clears throat> and so the G and F really are that whole um, contribution from the source, and then the F is the amount of cholesterol from that source, um, in that source fingerprint. So. So the fingerprints are in purple and the mass con and the masses from the sources are in the brown. Okay, so don't be scared if this is too much. We're good. Next slide. <coughs> I'm going to show you a simple, simple example first. Where in the simple example, you can imagine that there are two important sources that you're caring about, dust and meat cooking. And you um, want to use cholesterol to track the meat cooking and you want to use silicon to track the dust. And so these are the two simple equations you would have um, to, to do that. And again, you would then be measuring the cholesterol and silicon in the air. Somebody would help you understand the, the cholesterol and silicon in meat cooking and in dust emissions. So that's those F items. And then you'd be solving for G. <clears throat> so when you just have two equations and two unknowns, if you remember back to math class, you can solve this pretty simply and you can calculate these things. Of course, this is the simplest example and life's not quite that simple. So next slide. So the, I guess the other thing I should mention is what are the, what are the caveats associated with this type of approach? Um, so, so then can you just click the next one? Yeah. <clears throat> so to use this approach, you have to have fingerprints that are independent, which means you, you know, the, the amount of cholesterol and silicon from meat cooking can't be identical, or the ratios of cholesterol and silicon can't be identical. And that's, um, so there's a lot of people already working on that, so it's not a, something to stress about. Um, you need to have all the important sources of the comp for the compounds. So this is, you know, you can't do this if you're missing a source of cholesterol in your modeling approach. 
So again, there's been a lot of people working on source attribution. So there's a lot of background so that you don't have to stress too much about that. Um, the, the third approach is that you can't be uh, altering your compounds from your source to where you're measuring them. So this approach, it works really well in urban areas where you're, you're, you're collecting the PM um, in an urban area and it hasn't, trans, it hasn't been aged that long from the source to the, to the monitor. If you're doing it downwind of a city and the PM 2.5 is aging, you might have some more challenges. So it's kind of, the idea is this, this approach is best used in um, short term kind of urban areas. Okay, next slide. And I just wanted to throw an example of some numbers up there just to give you uh, <coughs> the, the idea here. So again, you would, on, you would be measuring the cholesterol and silicon in an air sample. Um, somebody else, or maybe you, will have measured the amount of silicon in meat cooking and in dust and emissions and the amount of cholesterol in, meat and, um, in the meat cooking and in the dust. And so you can use those numbers and solve for the Gs. And the G, and G would be here, G for meat cooking is the contribution of meat cooking to the PM 2.5 in that sample. And the G for dust is the contribution of dust to that PM 2.5 sample. Okay, next slide. So how do you get, so that's the math approach. So then how do you get um, all of that information, right? And so um, this is where the monitoring and chemical analysis comes in. And I'm showing kind of high level approach here. Um, what I'm showing on the left are filter samples. And so um, you would, and this is something that Ghana EPA, is, as, as Mr. Oppo was, was mentioning, has been doing for more than 10 years. You can put a filter sampler um, out, um, pull air through it, and the particulate matter gets collected on the bed of the filter, and you're left with, you know, a filter that is <coughs> discolored. Take that back to your lab, or you send it off, and there's analysis done. And so this kind of analysis, there's, there's varying types here. Um, the simplest approach is gravimetric, where you're trying to figure out the mass concentration on the, of the pollutant species. And then the other ones I mentioned here help you figure out the different components. For instance, cholesterol would be an organic molecular marker, so you have to use GCMS. Um, silicon would, would be a metal, and so you, you might be using ICPMS, or there's other approaches as well. Um, but those kind of chemical signatures are important to being able to run the uh, source apportionment, the top-down source apportionment. And then you would, so you, you do the chemistry, you generate an ambient chemical speciation database over there in blue, and then you can use that database to run a source apportionment model. And I'm kind of showing two different approaches here, the chemical mass balance and the positive matrix factorization. And I'll talk more about those in a minute. So next slide. Um, and this just goes, to sh just shows a little bit more details on the approach. So again, just showing you that you have a white filter, you put it in the field, it comes back, it's a dark filter. Um, and, and we usually typically use quartz filters to do organics uh, through the carbon analysis. We use Teflon filters to do mass analysis to prove stability. But there, there's a lot of different variety here and, and changes on this pathway really just alter um, some of the uncertainties associated with the, the different analysis. <coughs> And so I can help, if anyone wants more information on these approaches, I can talk more about them. I, I should say that um, I, I have been able to work with Mr. Oppo and his team to, to work on uh, and them generating capacity to do some of this um, in-house, which has been a, a nice uh, effort. So next slide. So back to um, this, the equations. So what we really end up having often is because there is some uncertainty and an error associated with things, I will, um, I'd like to mention that we often have more than two equations for the two unknowns so that we can try to minimize, so that we try to minimize the uncertainty. And that, and again, there's some complexity here that, that the models help to take care of. So next slide. So how do we solve for G? I guess I should backing up here. So why do we do those more, again, more equations and unknowns? Um, because of all the uncertainties um, it, and the assumptions aren't always perfect, it does allow us to be more certain in our answer. So next slide. So what we really do when we're solving, what the models do when we're solving those equations is they really try to generate solutions that minimize that E, that thing at the end. So they're trying to figure out how to, to have the smallest possible error. Um, so next slide. 
and actually what the nice thing about both both the models I'll talk about today is they're actually also there's some nuance associated with them where they're also normal they're reducing the error in those equations but they're balancing it by the error in the compound so a compound that's a high concentration will have the same effect on a uh, source apportionment as a compound that's in low concentration okay next slide so I want you to see some data because that's the fun part often for me. Um, and this is from Denver, just to start with. So if you were to look at, um, a, so this was uh, one year of PM 2.5 samples collected and, and then uh, chemistry was undertaken. And this is from the GCMS, where we're looking at organics. And these are two organic molecules um, <clears throat> that you see plotted for each day. So there's 365 data points here. Right? And you can see, you know, you look at this data and you're like, oh, that's interesting. What am I looking at? I see some things here, right? And so, uh, next slide. Um, you see right away that there's an edge to the data, we call it. <laughs> um, and next slide. It happens to be two edges, right? And so all of the kind of measurements are in between those two areas. So, next slide. What does that tell us? That tells us that there are probably, there is probably a source emitting um, the these pollutants there's actually probably two sources right one source has a ratio of the nc30 to nc29 that lies on the upper line and then the other source probably emits nc29 but not any nc30 and so in any one day those two sources will have um you know depending on the ratio of those two sources you'll have a ratio of pollutants on some days the the points lie on the bottom source profile which means this that only one source is impacting it and um, it, same for the top diagonal line if there's a point on there that means that only one source is impacting the air quality on that day and so you can see how powerful this can be as you start to try to understand the sources uh, across time so next slide <laughs> the other thing you can see is that a model might be able to distinguish these source profiles without you knowing them ahead of time so um, that's why there is this interesting um, spectrum of models that can be used in this approach. So next slide. So that's where I wanted to get to the kind of the, the top-down model spectrum. And this is just showing you that there are a range of tools that can be used here, right? And so um, on the right side of the spectrum, we use this thing called CMB, called Chemical Mass Balance Model, where you actually know the the fingerprint or source profile for each source involved um, and that has advantages and then on the left side if you don't know the source the fingerprint for the source profile you can use one of those models and it's a PMF um, positive matrix factorization and so those are the two uh, ends of the uh, spectrum and so next slide I'll talk about each one of them quickly uh, so the US EPA maintains a CMB or chemical mass balance model tool. The current version they have up is CMB 8.2. And again, it requires, um, it, the input data for it is both ambient measurements and source measurements. And the source measurements do exist on a database they call speciate. So there are people who've measured source fingerprints for lots of things out there, like diesel emissions, um, wildfire emissions, and things like that. And so that's in a database. <laughs> so, and, and those database, I should mention, are primarily uh, generated in the United States. So that's an important uh, piece of it. Some of the advantages to this kind of approach is that you can apply it to one tool. Um, the, the major limitation to this tool is that you really need to have representative source fingerprints. So if you, in that SPC8 data set, if there is nothing for, say, trash burning or open burning, you might have a, you might have a real challenge um, modeling PM2.5 in, in an area where that's an important source. Next, next slide. So positive matrix factorization, the other one that I mentioned is also a tool maintained by US EPA. Um, and it only, only requires ambient measurements um, of pollutant species. And so that's a big advantage, right? That you don't have to have source profiles. But there are um, some challenges there. And I, and I should have edited the slide, so I, I, will, I will send an edited version to HEI that um, gets posted later. But the major limitation for um, PMF is that you really, it's hard to link um, the output factors to sources. So you might get a factor that comes out and you're not exactly sure if it is um, a gasoline vehicle or burning of tires um, at a facility. And so that's, 
that's really where PMF can be a challenge and it takes um, working with some folks who know a lot about source emissions to be able to effectively map the output to sources. So both have pluses and minuses. Um, and I guess the good news is that, uh, next slide, is that uh, one of the things that my group has been able to, to collaborate with Mr. Oppo um, along with US, US EPA and World Bank in, on is, is to try to Im develop more skills to do source apportionment um, and capacity to do source apportionment in Accra. And, but also at the same time, we're, we're hoping to um, develop some new source profiles that we put in speciate so that for instance, open burning will be a source profile that will be, able to be used, which kind of opens the door to um, others using chemical mass balance in sub-Saharan Africa. So I, I just wanted to quickly show you that, um, talk about the approach we've done in Accra. Sorry, I think I'm a little over time. Um, we've been working with, and I have a picture here of two of Mr. Oppo's team, Jerry and John, um, as they took a visit to my lab in Boulder, and we talked to them about how we do things in our lab. But we've also traveled quite a bit to Accra to talk to them about how they sample and um, then after you measure how you do the chemical analysis. And so it's been nice to work with and collaborate with those staff folks on uh, standard operating procedures, which, which are a great starting point for other people. Um, and in, in general, the capacity that they're gaining in con EPA would be a, a great thing to be tapped by others in the region. Next, and so uh, next slide. So this is, we've, we've been also collaborating with uh, Mr. Oppen's team on source apportionment. Um, they have just started collecting PM 2.5 samples in the last year that, that are stored in a way that we can use them for uh, chemical analysis. And so um, this is showing some hot off the presses uh, results. Um, I probably should have sent this to Mr. Oppo ahead of time so he could see them there um, came out a couple of days ago. So what we're looking at is um, from roadside PM 2.5 filters that his team collected and they were sent to my lab first. We're, you know, we're trying to do the first analysis and then um, his team will do the second analysis to, and then do validation work. Um, but you can see that we're plotting kind of, kind of elemental, carbon versus, elemental carbon versus organic carbon on the left. And it just shows you that, you know, the spread of pollution levels, um, you know, they're, they're high. They're, there's a lot of your cities that are higher um, levels. But a, elemental carbon is a significant piece of the, um, or black carbon is a significant piece of the puzzle there. I think what was interesting is if you look on the right side, this is in the samples, you can see two um, organic marker species that typically come from motor oil burning. Um, so if you look at a car that's got white smoke coming out the tailpipe, that's usually motor oil burning. And so you can see that in these samples, we see two, you know, nice um, correlation between two motor oil markers that look really, looks really interesting. And these are nice high levels. Um, so next slide. <coughs> So, so I, I guess I should say that the, what you're seeing with that on the right side is the same thing we see in the United States in terms of the ratio between those two pollutants. And this shows that really quickly here. Um, this is a plot that those two markers for motor oil smoking. Um, the orange is from a study that's called PREPE, but it really is a study in Denver, Colorado um, that happened last year. And the blue is happening in Accra uh, this, this year. And so you can, what I'm really just showing is that the ratio of those pollutants or the source fingerprint for, mo for the smoking vehicles doesn't look like it changed much from the U.S. to Accra. And it just looks like there's more smoking vehicles in Accra. <clears throat> so, um, and this is a log log scale. So you can see it's actually a lot more. Um, so next slide. But some things are interesting, right? When we look at these tracer compounds, um, we, on the left side here, you see two compounds that we classically see from burning of biomass or wood and, or uh, agricultural debris. And so we have a, a nice ratio there of two things. The ratio you're seeing there is different than what we, the, the source profile that currently exists in speciate. So it might mean that, this, that what's being burned in Accra is slightly different in composition um, in terms of the biomass comp relative biomass composition than we have in that speciate data set from the United States. And on the right side, you see a really nice sharp correlation between two large molecules that we call polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. We don't see this in the United States, so this is a, probably a tracer from one source that we're not used to seeing. Um, and so we're digging into that a little bit too in my group. Okay, so next slide. All right, sorry, that was it. I just <coughs> went a little bit over there. So now we would like to invite uh, Dr. Eloise Murray from University of Leicester in the UK to talk a little bit about the accounting approach. Eloise?
Thanks, Pallavi. Um, <clears throat> so I think Mike set it up really nicely because the kind of data that he collects in places like Accra is what I would use uh, to develop my emission inventories. So I think this, this image is supposed to um, evolve. It's a GIF, but that's fine. I can just take you through it. So what it should be showing is um, sequentially through the decades in the 2000s, the change in the largest cities. Um, and what you would have seen for the 2100 map would be a concentration of 13 of the largest cities in Africa and, and then the remainder in um, Southeast Asia. <clears throat> Just to highlight how, <laughs> and you all on the call probably know this, how important Africa is going to be in the future for rapid development and also air quality concerns. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. This is also quite similar, except now just showing a time series of the population projections by the UN. And this is for a publication in 2015, but it hasn't changed much since. It still says that by 2100, the African population will rival that in Asia. So again, highlighting just how important a continent this is uh, to understand the emission sources um, so that we can develop policies that hopefully mitigate the air quality concerns that we've experienced already in Europe, in the US, in China, and now uh, predominantly in India. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> I'm going to take you through some of the steps in developing emission inventories and also give some idea of why, why I would develop these emission inventories. What am I interested in finding out? And I certainly am not uh, defining the field in terms of in emission inventory development. These are pretty standard approaches that we use. So to estimate emissions, we'll take the product of the activity factors, which would be something like the amount of fuel wood that's used to produce charcoal, and then multiply it by uh, literature sources of emission factors of all the different pollutants from that activity factor. So for charcoal production, it's a very inefficient process. And so it would lead to the formation of a lot of carbon monoxide, a lot of methane, a lot of organic aerosol, compared to something like vehicles that would tend to be more efficient and produce more NOx and relatively less carbon monoxide. We obtain the activity factors, or at least I predominantly obtain the activity factors from the UN database, which is publicly available. It provides the data in pretty user-friendly formats, uh, CSV formats, and the challenge, of course, is that it's at the country level. Um, and so we need to assume some information about how these emissions might be distributed spatially. And so that's what's shown in the second step. This would be mapping the emissions. So we might use something like a population distribution map, which would come from somewhere like Landscan, which is unfortunately proprietary, but there are freely available uh, population distribution data sets uh, available. Columbia University, for example, provides very detailed information about population distribution, uh, the urban population, the rural population. There's also information about the age distribution of these populations. We can also use information that's freely available from satellite observations, like the spatial distribution of gas flares that I've shown on the right. And we might be interested in this if we want to map the emissions from the source, which is quite uh, predominant in the Niger Delta and along the Sahara Desert, pretty much anywhere where we have oil and gas extraction that's relatively unregulated uh, in African countries. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so this is just showing a sampling of the spatial distribution of black carbon emissions that we uh, estimated. So I estimated this with uh, Christine Wiedenmeyer, who's based in the US. Uh, because we wanted to address the deficiencies in global emission inventories for representing this really unique mix of uh, inefficient pollution sources in Africa. And I certainly don't have to tell you what these pollution sources are, but the images get, just give a flavor of some of these pollution sources that we tried to incorporate in the inventory because there isn't detailed information in global inventories about proliferation of diesel and petrol generators, of ad hoc oil refining in the Niger Delta, of gas flaring, of kerosene use for lighting, although we are seeing that the source is starting to decrease, which is encouraging. Also, the types of vehicles in cities in Africa are far more inefficient than vehicles in Europe, for example, and these global emission inventories tend to use emission factors for Europe. So to the best of the ability we could, we gather the information in the literature to try and also address the misrepresentation of the emission factors from these sources. <clears throat> uh, next slide. 
I should also say that the Dice Africa inventory, I think there's a, uh, there is a link to it on the presentation, is publicly available, it's downloadable, it includes documentation on how to incorporate it in an inventory or how to make use of it if you wanted to assess emissions in your region of interest. And then I'll just go through some of the applications of the, the inventory. So we also wanted to look at what the future will look like for pollution sources from fossil fuels in Africa, because it's in a unique position to actually avoid this dependence on fossil fuel that's been, uh, that's occurred in all other parts of the world and has led to such poor air quality. Renewable energy is prolific, is, renewable energy resources are, are prolific and it's becoming much, much cheaper to use renewable energy. Um, but there is already substantial investment in fossil fuels for energy as well as transport. And this is illustrated to some degree in the images that I show. On the left is the generating capacity per capita, per country, for those countries that have uh, fossil fuel usage for electricity generation in 2012. And then the triangles show where the fossil fuel uh, power plants are located. And then on the right is the 2030 estimate. And these aren't made up numbers. These are collected from the end coal database that tells us about the future uh, planned, commissioned um, power plants across the African uh, continent, where the triangles here show the additional power plants that will be added by roughly 2030. And of course, there's some variability in the timeline of all of these. Uh, what was encouraging from this is that the generating capacity increases faster than the population increases, but what's, dis what's disconcerting is that it is predominantly from fossil fuels. Next slide. And so in putting together this emission inventory, we also mapped it to the location of these power plants. We projected what we thought 2030 emissions might be from transport, and the spatial distribution of these are shown for SO2 or sulfur dioxide, NOx or nitrogen oxides, and then primary PM 2.5, which is black carbon and organic carbon. SO2 and NOx are precursors of sulfate and nitrate, which go on to form PM 2.5, and NOx is also a precursor of ozone. So all of these have the potential to impact local air quality. Um, in Central Africa, there's very efficient injection of these pollutants into the mid and upper troposphere, so there's additional potential to impact the energy balance of the Earth. I've also included the black values are the total emissions for the continent. And then the colored values below show the distribution from power plants and cars for each of these pollution sources. And you can see SO2 and NOx is dominated by power plants. Primary PM 2.5 is dominated by cars. And we found that a large contribution to organic aerosol is from motorcycles, which are prolific and because they're an easy way to get around um, in a traffic congested city. Next slide. So then what we do is we apply this to a chemical transport model, and the chemical transport model that I use is GeosChem. It's publicly available, the source code is available on the website, the, the link is included at the bottom of the slide, uh, but it does require some resources to be able to run it, so for CPUs, but there's now a capability for GeosChem to run on the Amazon cloud, uh, and students get $100 free to be able to use the Amazon web services. Um, so it's definitely worth trying to, trying to see if you can get your hands dirty running Geoschem on the Amazon web service. So what Geoschem does is that it receives emissions that can be natural, human, and there's a whole host of emissions included in Geoschem, including Dice Africa and the fossil fuel emission inventories that I showed on the previous slide. And then it also feeds in uh, offline assimilated meteorology that comes from NASA. The model then calculates the chemistry, the transport, the dry and wet deposition, other components, but these are the most relevant for what I'm doing. And then it spits out 3D global and regional atmospheric concentrations. And for air quality, the ones relevant to me would be surface concentrations of ozone and PM 2.5 or fine particles. Next slide. So what's shown here is the output from GeosChem. So there's three, three iterations of it. So GeosChem carries all of the different components of PM 2.5. So organic aerosol, black carbon, sulfate, nitrate, ammonium, rather than carrying PM 2.5 as a lumped uh, species in the model. And so you can tease out the different contributions in the model to the extent that it's accurate. The left hand side shows all of the components from PM 2.5 in 2012 from the model and you can see it's flooded by <laughs> dust from the Sahara Desert. But we can remove the dust contribution and sea salt contribution to see what the other components 
uh, add to the PM2.5. We see that the levels are much, much lower, but we can start to see things like Lagos and uh, the Niger Delta, Cairo, the concentration of power plants in the high felt in South Africa. And then in Central Africa, we see the contribution from intense open burning uh, that happens in the dry season on either side um, of the, the equator. We can also run the model in the future, so it acts like a time machine for us. We can put in our 2030 emissions, hold everything else constant, so not to confound the results that we obtain, and then we can subtract the 2030 version of the model from the 2012 ver version of the model and get the enhancement that would result from this increase in emissions in 2030, and that's what's shown on the far right-hand side. And we start to see features show in Southern Africa, we have this really large enhancement and this results from this extensive increase in power plants in this region. I think if you just click next, it'll show a little bit of an animation um, showing the wind distribution. There you go. So that's just the circulation pattern that leads to this extent, uh, this large extent of uh, pollution through Southern Africa. There's a power plant south of Abuja that's uh, established by 2030. Abuja is the fastest growing city in Africa. So there's really large potential for uh, exposure um, to PM 2.5 from this source. And then we also see quite a, a diffuse enhancement in Egypt, extending out to Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> and we also give these uh, PM 2.5 estimates to um, the Harvard School of Public Health, and they estimate the premature deaths that are likely to re result, result from exposure to this additional PM 2.5, and they estimated for the whole of the continent of uh, 48,000 premature deaths. The highest, um, in, highest ranking countries are Nigeria and South Africa, which is typical. But what was surprised me, what came third was Malawi, which doesn't typically rank when we look at um, impacts on, on health. And the reason is because of this concentration of power plants in Southern Africa and also a rapidly increasing population in Malawi. So these two factors contribute to quite a large um, <clears throat> estimate of premature death. Uh, next slide. I'm just going to take you through this briefly. This is a project that my student uh, is working on. Alfred Bukhari, he's from Sierra Leone. He's doing a PhD with me. He's actually based at University of Birmingham. And he's building an improved emission inventory of the charcoal supply chain in Africa because it's growing at such a rapid rate. Uh, it's estimated that it's growing at about 7% per year. And so this is a really important source to try and study to assess its contribution to air pollution, its contribution to uh, radiative forcing, and also its contribution to uh, reducing or at least degrading um, local forests. It's also interestingly a major export in Somalia, and this is fueling civil unrest there. There's actually a trade that happens with the Gulf states um, where there's an exchange of charcoal for weapons. It also includes plastic burning to initiate combustion, predominantly in slums um, outs located, located outside of large urban areas. And this has also been included in the, in the inventory. And so my student has developed this inventory. He's incorporated it in Geoschem, run the model, to assess the contribution of the charcoal supply chain to uh, air quality. And so if you go to the next slide, that shows those results. Oh, well, not yet. This just shows the spatial distribution to give you a flavor of how the charcoal production and use is distributed. Charcoal production is distributed close to roads uh, because of the easy access to, to roads to be able to transport it to cities. Uh, and then the use is concentrated in cities and then on the outskirts in, in slums. Now the next slide will show <laughs> the air quality impact from uh, estimated with Geoschem. And we see about a one microgram per meter cubed increase in annual mean PM 2.5 in across West Africa uh, because of this uh, rapid increase in, in use of charcoal and also along the East Africa Rift Valley. The increase in ozone is much lower, but these results are still to come. We suspect that we're going to see a large contribution to tropospheric ozone, which would have an impact on climate. But my student is still analyzing these results. Um, and then the next slide, I think, is just my acknowledgments. Yeah, so just to show, this is my research group. Alfred pictured on the left is the person doing, uh, developing the charcoal inventory and running it in Geoschem. And then my collaborators and contributors to this work are just shown and then also just to thank funding agencies who sustain my research. And then for, for you, the listeners, the next slide uh, shows some resources that might be useful either for funding opportunities that I managed to identify. No doubt they're more than I've shown here, but these are ones that I'm aware of. 
and then also the resources that are publicly available for people to use um, that include the emission inventories and includes modeling tools and includes output from the model as well i haven't included this yet but you know if you look back at that web page you'll see the data from geoschem that i showed previously and then of course the un data portal it's really useful for um, identifying these activity factors needed to develop uh, emission inventories. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much to all of our um, panelists for sharing what they're doing, for talking us through the different approaches to understand the source contributions. We are running a little bit behind time due to our technical difficulties earlier. Uh, but as we mentioned at the beginning, all of the resources that were mentioned by all of the speakers will be shared uh, with all of you in the form of a PDF document. Additional resources that are available, especially for application in uh, low and middle income countries, will also be shared. If there are any specific questions, please type them into the chat panel. We have about three minutes left, uh, so not a lot of time. Uh, I, I do see a comment regarding copies of presentations. We will definitely be sharing the slides. The webinar has also been recorded, so it will be available for you if you want to share it with others. Go back and look at some of the specific sections that you are interested in. And we were not able to hear Mr. Apo very clearly towards the beginning, so he will be um, kindly providing us a written statement regarding all of the developments that are undergoing in um, Ghana and we definitely encourage you to contact them to see how you could work with them. Um, all of our panelists have expressed an interest in, in helping um, any and all uh, who, who would want to continue some of this work. But if I could take a minute uh, really quickly and uh, Mike perhaps just very in, you know, in a few words, if you could talk a little bit about the kind of time and resources that are needed to do these top-down or detective kind of studies. Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the, when, when we've th thought about this in the past, obviously there's, a, there's a, lots of variation on these and it depends on whether you're a country wants to develop their own capacity um, to do that. Um, and then again, Mr. Apo has a really good idea of that because he's been building, you know, he's been developing um, sampling equipment and chemical analysis equipment. Um, if you want um, someone external to come in and do a, a quick study, uh, not a quick study, a year-long study um, where you collect PM2.5 and then have uh, chemical analysis done and source apportionment, um, that kind of a scale is somewhere around $100,000 probably, uh, US dollars to get that done. <coughs> But I think the capacity building is an exciting piece and it'd be interesting to see how um, you know, some of the people could collaborate to do that in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, thank you. Um, Eloise, a quick question on charcoal production. Um, apparently charcoal contribution does not really consider the production methods, uh, only looks at the total amount produced. So how is this accommodated when you think about future emissions? Um, sure. So if the, the person asking this is referring to um, maybe the different um, combustion efficiencies, we do make some broad assumptions about, about this. So there are different ways in which charcoal is produced using earth kilns and other approaches. My understanding is that uh, earth kilns are dominant um, across Africa and the, the uh, combustion efficiency can be as low as 5%. Um, and this is true. This is a challenge. How do we better? How do we appropriately represent all of the flavors of charcoal production in an emission inventory? <clears throat> but yeah, we make a we make quite a broad assumption about what the um, production approach is. Okay, and just as we wrap up, if you could also briefly comment on time, um, resource, um, you know, money sort of required to do these kinds of um, emission inventory projects. Uh, well, that's a challenge. I suppose it really depends. It depends on how much time and effort you, you have available to put into the emission inventory. It depends on whether you want to make uh, raw measurements of emission factors. My approach has been typically to rely on what's available in the literature. And I have, a, um, I have students, PhD students who work on 
developing the emission inventories. So I guess the cost associated with this is um, employing uh, a PhD student. And that varies from institute to institute. Great. Yeah. Um, so I we do have a few other uh, questions, but we are running um, out of time now. It's already 10 o'clock. Some of the attendees have also added in uh, comments the kinds of projects that they are undertaking and that they would be open for collaboration. So as we circulate the resource list to you, um, hopefully by the end of this week, we will include all of those um, contacts as well. And we really encourage all of you to connect with each other and um, you know identify opportunities to collaborate we also encourage you to check our um, report which looked at uh, the ghana sources in particular and uh, as i've already said that said before we will be sharing the slides as well as a recording of the webinar on our website uh, that is www.stateofglobalair.org we will email you when that is available, so you can rest assured on that front. There were a couple of questions here that we were not able to address in the webinar, so we will reach out to you individually and make sure that your, answer, uh, your questions get answered. Uh, but thank you very much again to our panelists for taking time and all of you attendees for being here with us uh, from different parts of the world. And we look forward to uh, continuing this communication with you in um, future months. Thank you very much.